between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, like the founder of Noah Alper of Einstein Bagels, he talked about several previous businesses that were not successful and how he finally hit on Einstein Bagels to grow it. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com, run by myself and co founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Jake Cloberdance, co founder and CEO of One Hope. It's a brand with a mission to serve the world, and they back it up, and I'll tell you what they do. The company started with an award-winning wine brand, OneHopeWine.com, and has since expanded into gourmet coffee and other gifts. They've gone from selling from zero to selling over 750,000 bottles a year since its inception. That's amazing, Jake. On, on the serving, the world side of things, One Hope has donated more than $2 million to date, helping to provide over 1.1 million meals to people in need, plant 56,000 trees, and much more. And as a side note, Jake was a two-time national champion in rugby at University of California, Berkeley, so don't mess. Thanks, Jake, for joining me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, bud. You know, I I mentioned this because this is one of my favorite stories from doing my research is um, you started your journey in philanthropy, um, not completely, True, but by doing something illegal. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've shared uh, a story uh, a couple of times amongst friends, I guess, and we're friends here. So. <laughs> right. uh, just about uh, the first time that I, uh, I sold some extra tickets to a game, um, to uh, one of our big games, and uh, made, a lot of, made a lot of money and, and ended up donating a, a big portion of it, probably out of uh, guilt as a, uh, as a younger person testing testing the lines and uh, figuring out my uh, ethical and moral code at the time, if you will. Um, but I think one of the stories I haven't really shared, um, you know, that is, I think, equally as uh, interesting and engaging and a big part of um, how I kind of came across this idea of combining social good with having a good time. Um, in, in college, I... Uh, was very active, as you said. I, I played rugby there. I actually played football when I first came in uh, as well, and then um, was in business school, active in the student government, kind of the the prototype uh, person um, that ultimately ended up getting recruited into the job I did out of college. Um, but I was also part of a fraternity, and I was uh, I became social chair my senior year, and um, I also was philanthropy chair. So. I had uh, kind of a moment of brilliance where I decided to combine those two budgets and throw double the amount of parties, but turn every single party into a, a fundraiser. Mm. And, um, and our, our whole um, fraternity, of course, got behind this idea as well. And so we became that group that every time we threw an event, there was um, some, some sort of fundraising at the door, um, whether it was a basketball tournament or a typical party. And we actually raised uh, more money than uh, all the rest of the fraternities combined that wow. year, my senior year, for the Oakland's Children's Hospital. Mm. And um, I do remember thinking that it was a brilliant from a business concept uh, at the time because we got, to, we got a much bigger budget for throwing our social events. Um, but it also taught me that those two things can be combined somewhat seamlessly um, and that uh, you could um, feel really good at the end when you're presenting that big check uh, as well, and I, I don't think I had thought about it from that perspective of how rewarding that would be until um, that that period. And so that was kind of one of those stories that I think drove me right as I stepped out of college, thinking in that way and thinking from that paradigm. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And at that point, did you know that you were going to form a company that was going to also, you know, kind of be linked with social good? 
I don't know that I formally knew, like I hadn't written a business plan for One Hope at the time. Right. And um, it did strike me at that time, like um, whatever I do and whatever I, I put my energy into um, to bring people around a, a mission or a business idea, part of that mission is going to be um, serving uh, something bigger than yourself and something bigger than that event, um, yeah. if you will. And um, as I started to think about that in combination with my first job out of college, if you combine those two, looking back in hindsight, that's probably what gets us to, to One Hope. What was your first job out of college? Uh, my first job out of college was, um, well, I really had a, a couple, but my first one formally and my first big corporate job was with Gallo Wine Company, the largest wine company in the mm. world. Great organization. Um, really taught me from zero to one about wine um, yeah. in my, my early days. And, and now I've kind of taken that from maybe one to 50, and I still have a long ways to go to get to 100. But they um, provided a great foundation. And then I also had launched a, a fun uh, little online site with um, some buddies, computer science buddies from Berkeley. And so that was kind of um, the combination of things I would work on along with Hope Wine at the time, which was um, later transitioned into One Hope. And um, so when I got out of school, I had Gallo as my, my central day job. And then I was building uh, a tech site with some buddies and also working on uh, One Hope very quietly. Was Jake, what, what were your biggest lessons you learned from Gallo? that you take with to one hope one uh gallo is just one of the best at uh keeping work ethic uh going in their organization and um a big part of their culture isn't just what they celebrate uh as a culture and talk about um the exciting you know stuff is also about the kind of people that um get driven out of uh their organization or don't work at their organization if uh, you're comfortable with mediocrity. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, leave Gallup because they're uh, very successful people and they're they're meant to be that way. But I think they attract some of the most talented people because of their standard for excellence. Mm -hmm. And being able to do that at such a large scale, as you go out and start your own business, you realize why some of the processes they had in place are in place and some of the controls um, obviously, there's all kinds of challenges when you're that big, and there's all kinds of things that are different about their brand and, and the way they run their company than us. Um, but a lot of that's uh, a luxury that we have as the little guy chasing Goliath. And right. stay as Goliath for so many years, um, you know, there's some magic behind that, but there's also just a lot of blocking and tackling that goes into that. And so yeah. I think just doing the basics really well and working really hard, like um, some of those standard things that you see across the most successful businesses are what I got a first taste of there. Mm -hmm. I want to get into why wine for you in a second, but I don't, I know you downplayed the, the ticket selling that a lot of the, the, you know, you got some mom guilt when that happened, yeah. right? And your mom is a big influence for you though. Yeah. Talk about your mom's influence for you growing up till, till now. Yeah, um, my my mom uh, has been a huge influence. You're right. You def you definitely uh, drove back into the uh, the historical conversations that I've had because she does uh, come up as a, a central focal point a lot of times. Um, mostly because our woman our company is seventy percent woman run, and um, and then we have this uh, even larger community of an extended family and team within One Hope of um, our, our cause entrepreneurs that I'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. And out of 1,500 of them, about 1,450 are women. So really? working with wow. women and respecting uh, women's uh, abilities and um, their strengths um, relative to men, but also just independently of yeah. their gender um, has been something that was kind of, I, I think, uh, isn't something that ne it sets me apart uh, as much these days because I think we're going in a really good direction. But I think it was always just uh, I got it through osmosis from mm. seeing it. Well, you had two sisters also, right? Yeah, I'm the middle boy. So uh, what was it like? Tell me, two sisters. So, not, so yeah. that's, that's the getting it through osmosis, right? Like you're, you're around women your whole life and albeit you know, strong and empowered 
women between your two sisters and your mom. And, um, you know, it's not like you have to be told to respect them. It's like you have to live with them uh, growing up and learn to work with them really well right. and learn makes them tick just like they learn to uh, live in a, a single habitat with me. Um, my sisters, um, they each have their own story. My little sister uh, has, has served time uh, in the Peace Corps uh, mm. in Africa for three years. Wow. Um, she's a, a nurse, got her master's in psychiatric nursing. She serves the world, and she's wow. been in the trenches doing it. That's amazing. Um, my sister is really smart and very different than my younger sister, and and just they're they're not polar opposites, but they're on very different. Uh, ends of the spectrum in a lot of ways. Um, and then my mom is the entrepreneur of the family and uh, was a, a real, I always looked at her as a risk taker when we were young and I think she gave me a lot of my, um, you know, I'm, I'm not <clears throat> a risk adverse person well, to say the least mm -hmm. and, um, and taught me to like, you know, um, try things and break things and um, not be afraid of it and never got <clears throat> mad at me when once in a while I crossed the line um, actually she did, but she understood, you know, because, um, I think she crossed the line a couple of times and tested boundaries and things like that. And so <clears throat> I look at her outside of, um, uh, of the impact of, um, what it's been to me in now working with as many women as I do and mm. stuff. Um, also as a mother figure being that, um, you know, well-rounded, do everything mom, um, both a mom and a, and a business role model to me. Um, and that's a rare combination, um, in a, a still generally paternal, uh, corporate culture, yeah. uh, worldwide and, and particularly in the U S. So, you know, what's also interesting is I, I'm curious, Jake, when you were growing up, what you wanted to be when you grew up, I feel like when I was doing the research, you think differently. And there was this one story where, they thought they, I don't know if you should advance because there was like the words big, tiny, small, and something else. And you circled big, or you circled, sorry, small, that was not like the others because the second letter wasn't an I like the other ones. Like you just thought differently, it seemed, um, than most people. What, what did you want to do when you grew up? Um, I went through different phases, you know. I, I wanted to be a doctor um, when I was in first grade and... It, it's interesting when you look at uh, what a kid wants to do when they're younger. Um, I generally, I, I think there's a lot of subconscious and conscious wrapped up in that of um, uh, what at that time what they see themselves as um, or they aspire to be um, a, and have other people see them as. And I think you know I have a paper. One of my uh, oldest little projects I have is like writing what you wanted to be when you grow up. Mm. And that's why I know that I had said doctor and that I wanted to cure cancer. And, and at that time, I didn't even really grasp what cancer was. I didn't grasp it until probably 18 years later, really, the true, truly what went on when somebody gets cancer. I just knew it was like a really bad thing and that that was probably like a really uh, thoughtful and meaningful answer, mm. you know? And yeah. I think, um, now I try to kind of look back at that and say, mm, what drove me then to, to want that versus now I, I think about my biggest impact in life being through, um, being able to do that through business and, right. and our business. But um, I also went through a stage of wanting to be a business person like my mom. I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. I went through a phase where I wanted to be a sports agent because Jerry Maguire was like a, one of my favorite movies <laughs> growing up. And so... Uh, and I love sports and stuff. And so I, I remember different phases that I went through. But I think generally from about my sophomore year of high school on, I said, I, I want to build a big business mm. someday. And I want to build a movement. And I've, um, and I've always had this little like uh, interest in uh, some at some point going into public service. Um, but I've, I've always hesitated to um, talk too much about that because I think that I have a, a lot to accomplish in business before I would make mm -hmm. that move. You know? So you were working on One Hope also on the side while you were doing your, your full-time day job. Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I was just starting to have the early ideas for it mm -hmm. and starting to look into it and research it. I actually ended up um, leaving uh, the, the wine business to pursue 
um, I, I just knew that I wanted to pursue one of the businesses that I had um, started. And one was uh, One Hope, which at the time wasn't really a business formally uh, in the fact that it was just me. You know? Yeah. What and was that, it early on? What did it look like? Um, early on, when, when I first came up with the concept, uh, it was October of 2005, actually. And it was just going to be a, a cool um, fundraising device. Um, and I thought about it as um, a, a small wine brand that I could raise some money for local causes with and mm. um, and really was triggered to do it because a good girlfriend of mine got blood cancer mm. and wow. was a, it was a, an area for me to vent that energy and um, show support with her um, in probably like the most productive way I could. Right. Uh, and, um, but... You know, the the other company that I was starting with my friends was originally called The Bar Book. It was going to be, you know, the Facebook after you got out of college because that was only around for about six months. And it became the scene.com. And we and ultimately became, you know, uh, the most traffic nightlife app on Facebook. And, really? Um, wow. And, and we went through, you know, the 2008 time where money froze up and um, uh, my my buddy who was the CEO um, sold it and I was the president. And, and at the time I had One Hope kind of starting to gain some momentum on the side uh, of that more so in mind. And that's really the reason why I left uh, Gallo was to pursue that and this uh, Hope Wine thing that was going on. But Hope Wine was really looked at as more of a personal thing initially for me and, and a hobby side project kind of a thing. And then you know, my mom was actually uh, the person when I recount it that would always be like, what's going on with the Hope Wine? Are you still putting some energy into that? Is there momentum there? And checking in on it because she thought that that was the better idea out of the mm. two. And, out and of the bar book, you mean, compared to the bar book? book? Yeah. And, and it turns out it was, you know, um, although that, that idea was really good as well and could have been something. It, it basically was Facebook pages before Facebook had pages four bars and clubs, you know, and it, and it had a, there was a lot of cool technology that we built there, but we were ahead of our time. Um, people didn't have smartphones at the time. So, um, for the most part, so you couldn't really do a lot of the cool stuff that we were creating on it. That was social. Um, but anyways, that was, that was initially why, um, I decided to take this leap was the combination of just wanting to start a business. And I had two that I, that excited me a lot more than working for a big company mm -hmm. and so that was enough and then you know within a couple months of when i left um it, it became apparent to me that one hope was calling my heart more than anything why is that because of your friend uh well i think that that was a part that was there you know consistently but other layers started building up on it um i just started realizing that i was thinking about it more than i was anything else um, and I also had a number of people at, uh, that I worked with at Gallo that I, I respected the most while I worked with them, um, reach out to me and tell me they thought it was super cool as mm. I started to get a little bit of headway mm. and that they would love to help out on it. And, That's great. Um, and when I kind of saw that and I saw the first, um, early signs that a couple accounts wanted to pick it up and stuff, I knew that there was enough traction there yeah. where it was calling my name and, I didn't really know the path and I hadn't planned it out a lot, but I knew that it was the right move when I finally decided to go full time on that and go that direction. It was definitely hard because, you know, four of my best buddies were starting a company across the, across the way with me as well. So, and I really believed in them. Um, and it's, it's funny how everything progressed, you know, it's now 10 years later from when we started that company. Um, I helped one of them found a company that he's now sold um, a separate technology company and, and sat on the board from beginning to sale. Um, one of the guys um, is now our head of marketing at One Hope. Um, another one went on to found another huge technology company that's that's about a billion dollar uh, tech company wow. with other people. And so all of us went our separate ways and, and found our successful route, and we all still keep in touch and know what each other are working on. So it's, um, it's cool to think back about what could have been, but it also tells you that like either way, as long as we it would have been successful, we were going to make it. You know? Right. So, 
So what did when you when you went full time on One Hope? This this seems like I'd be nervous at the time. Like, what were your what were your feelings and what what did you have to do at that point? Uh, where were you at with the business when you went full time? Um, when I went full time, uh, we had uh, you know ten thousand dollars in the um, in the bank. So, so I'm, I'm scared lot- right now. So how do you eat and live? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think you know part of it was. Uh, naivety, um, like we were just naive. No matter how you looked at it, when you're 23, you are naive. Even people who are born to be the, the biggest and best, the Steve Jobs, the Mark Zuckerberg, they're naive too, com- relative to where they end up getting to. Right. Um, so by default, we were naive, but it actually ended up being the thing that gave us the opportunity to do it and not be scared, you know. Um, the combination of that and, you know, my friend Morgan um, getting cancer uh, didn't just, you know, inspire this. It also was a wake up call to me about one mortality um, that life is short mm-hmm. and it did strike a, a little bit of fear in me. And then on the same accord and, and in balance with that, it also made me fearless because all of a sudden I was... Um, I was just like, life is short, you know? And so... You'll just go for it. Interesting balance between um, your fearlessness being driven out of uh, the, the same thing that is creating fear that it could end tomorrow. Right. And you have, you know, a very short window in life to do what you want to do. And so that, that drove us a long way, you know? It drove me a long way. Right. And I, I was able to channel that energy to a group of inspired, similar age people. Yeah. And um, if uh, that's probably the most important thing I did in founding the company mm-hmm. was make uh, that team believe uh, that we could do it against all odds. And, and yeah. what my friend and I talk about is keeping the band together, being one of the most in- important parts of actually starting a, a small company and getting it off the ground. Right. And Jake, you started the company, you recruited eight of your friends, right? So I'm curious, it's hard enough to recruit one person or two people or three people. How did you recruit eight people to found the company with you and you have $10,000? Um, <laughs> uh, so it was seven people. Oh, seven, was seven and you, I got you, okay. Um, still, still, my, my question still stands, yeah. Two of them were ready to become entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, what did you tell them? I mean, this, this um, was the most convincing speech ever. Yeah, it wasn't all at once. It happened over the course of three months. Okay. And it was a combination of me recruiting them and them recruiting One Hope and wanting to be part of it, mm-hmm. you know? So it wasn't all to my credit. A lot of it is the power and magic of One Hope yeah. uh, that brought people around it because it was a, a mission that naturally united people. But... I do tell people that was the biggest sale of the the whole thing along the way. It wasn't to investors and um, to, you know, the whole foods of the world and Virgin America and things like that. It's getting your, your team on board. Yeah. And um, what'd you tell them? You know, when we, when we all got together to launch it full time, I said, um, here's the thing today we have, um, we don't have enough money to even pay anybody at the end of this month. Right. Uh, which, um, could, could be looked at as a bad thing and it, <laughs> right. and it could be looked at as a good thing because we need to start selling immediately and right. we're all salespeople. And in this company, no matter what position, uh, you're doing, you're a salesperson with us, you know, mm-hmm. and we're all on that team together. Right. Um, and, uh, I said that we would figure out a way everybody would get a, a consistent paycheck. It would be smaller than what they had come from. But everybody would have significant ownership over the brand they're building, and we would figure it out along the way together, and we'd be honest with each other and transparent. Um, and uh, everybody was willing to go off of that, you know. And um, the second month of uh, going full time on it, um, you know, we ha- we missed h- half a payroll at the end of the the month, and so there were a handful of people who were able to to do that. I asked basically who can afford to to skip this run. Um, and, um, ever since then we've never missed a payroll ever again, you know? Mm. Um, but, uh, but 
it was ten thousand dollars and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of credit cards to wow. um, get the business off the ground. And I was on my last little bit that I could uh, that I could squeak out. Um, I had moved, you know, uh, done all of the bank transfer thing or credit card transfers and zero percent. You maxed it out. That, that I could do. Yeah. It's just amazing that I was only twenty three at the time, and luckily my credit was really good in college because. I drained it all the way, you know, and then um, we got our first investor really about four months in and um, it got us to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And it's like now, you know, we're on our Series C financing and um, the company's at a very different place, obviously. But um, it that that first one, um, it couldn't have come any later. Uh, it, it was about within about the week that uh, it was okay. going to take it. So, so what did you do with the first 150k? Uh, paid people. <laughs> yeah, paid people as as uh, as little as we could afford, and bought inventory and yeah. bought a storage unit. Yeah. Um, and put 168 cases into it, and we started selling. Um, and we, you know, used. Our, our buddy lived in one of those apartment units that had like a common room. We used that for our office for the first mm-hmm. few. Um, we asked, we got friends to do things. I got my friend who's now, you know, oversees our um, whole, you know, uh, marketing side and, and particularly the e-commerce side who came from the other company I had started. He made our first website for us, you know, and he, he got some little bit of founder's equity and stuff. And right. um, so, you know, the, I didn't have a lot of cash, but I, I had um, equity, um, which is our own mint. And that's when I learned the power of, you know, tying people to a brand. Um, it's different than cash because cash can be spent right away. But when you own something, um, you outside of the actual ownership on paper and ultimately someday becoming worth something, you intrinsically own it and mm. you part of it. Right. And you it's part of your legacy, not just part of your bank account. And part of um, you know, and gone once you buy something material. How did you know what to buy at the time? Um, I didn't. I mean, <laughs> I I knew because that's the, a big decision too, right? Because the majority of money is like the product that you're going to sell. Yeah, I, I knew um, what to prioritize. I knew we needed wine to make money and to show a product. So right. That that took a precedent, and I knew to um, spend money on. People, because I know that people are, are the number one thing that make businesses, mm-hmm. and, um, and then everything else was whatever we could afford and uh, and get by on. And um, there were a lot of things that got nose uh, at that time um, for for obvious reasons. So, um, yeah. I mean, because that's that's a, a tough thing. Do you do you label it yourself at the time, or do you buy like initially? Um, to resell another wine and just donate uh, to a cause. I'm just trying to figure out what would it look like early on because obviously you know, now we, you have your own brands and you have like a, a million different varieties of it. What was it like in the very beginning? Um, the, in the very beginning, I went to a company, Sonoma Wine Company. They're actually the largest winery in Sonoma. We're, they were great partners of ours. Um, and at the time, they just made bigger brands there and they didn't have a private label program, but they did have access to bulk wine stuff. And so I went there with three bottles with, you know, homemade labels and pulled them out and was like, this is Hope Wine, you know, and um, presented to this woman, Lisa, who, who uh, was kind of the general manager there. And she was like, yeah, um, we'll give it a shot. We have some Chardonnay and some Cabernet and Merlot, and um, we can sell you some of our wine. We'll sell you a pallet of each and um, and we'll do it. And it was, it, you know, it's a really small amount of business. So at the time they're losing money on taking a client like that. Right. Um, we grew it to, you know, over 5,000 cases with them. Wow. Um, and they ended up, um, creating this as part of their business model, doing private label and right. wine. And as we got bigger, we of course wanted to have more control and, and get out in front of sourcing the wines that were to our particular taste and stuff yeah. and be part of the winemaking. So mm-hmm. we got to know the winemaker there and all that stuff. And then that kind of got us to around year four, which is when 
um, you know, we we made the relationship with the Mandavi family happen. And really, in year three, first meeting Michael Mandavi um, at a trade show, and not not knowing who he was, but him hearing our pitch in the most organic and authentic way, and um, us pouring wine behind there, which tells you something about where we were at the time, where I was still, you know, um, pouring wine behind a trade show table. And not that I, I wouldn't, you couldn't find me or catch me once in a while doing that these days, but it was a lot more often then. Right. And the fact that Michael Mandavi was at those kinds of things also going around. Here's this guy who's a legend of the industry, right. still working hard, learning about new brands, um, learning about the, the industry and the new up and comers. And he took to art because I think he saw a little bit of the entrepreneur that he was in us. And, um, you know, he has his own great story of helping his father get Robert Mandavi to, you know, one of the early winery, first pro, post-prohibition wineries to being really an icon of, of the Napa Valley and a global brand. And he, um, he ends up being the CEO and chairman, and um, they sell in a, a very documented uh, exit that, that went on. But um, no matter whether you sell a brand um, that you create or not, you don't sell that skill set and um, and that hunger and Michael still to this day has that he you could feel it coming off of us. Really? I think he felt it coming off of us and so next thing led to the next and and we ultimately end up uh, having his son the grandson of Robert Mandavi Robert Mandavi Jr. Um, co-creating our wines with us and mm. being not only a, a winemaker with us but um, you know really letting us still own the flavor profiles and um, the, our wine portfolio and still be a reflection of us, not just him. Um, he's a big part of it and his fingerprints are all over our brand. Right. Uh, but, uh, but sharing it with us and, and being able to um, just be a part of something like that rather than having to be front and center. Um, he's always been more than fair about that. So that's kind of, um, you know, me taking you on a, a journey beyond how we got started with wine yeah. and where we are today with making our wines with Rob and, and Tony Coltrane as well, who was a, a winemaker for Opus One in their early days and for Robert Mandavi with 52 Harvests under his belt. Um, it's been quite the journey on the production and, and, and as some may call it manufacturing side. Yeah. Jake, there's so much to cover from the challenges, the milestones, to distribution, to how you sold initially. Um, but since we have limited time, I'm going to fast forward to today and what's working really well And um, for you is the Via One Hope. So I'd love for, to, for you to talk about that program and what's going on with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, um, I'm really excited about Via One Hope. Um, you probably... if, if you checked into it, you kind of understand the model is really not so different than um, kind of uh, what you've seen with Mary Kay or Tupperware or Stella and Dot, these um, party planning models. Um, we refer to it as merit-based marketing. So mm -hmm. people who join this organization, um, they really um, make money and can make an impact based on a meritocracy, which I think it was one of my most important learnings about the way that um, Cal Rugby ran and why we were a championship organization is it ran off of meritocracy. Um, when I was a senior, I had freshmen nipping at my heels and some of them were better athletes than me and they saw playing time, you know, and they, and, um, they beat me out if they were better than me on a given week. And at the time, that's hard to swallow, you know, when you're a, a senior and you've been paying your dues for a long time, right. you start to realize that championship organization loyalty is important and it's celebrated, but um, meritocracy is even more important um, for keeping an organization um, present and around and, and uh, giving it edge. Right. And um, so we've, we've pulled a lot of that thinking uh, into Via One Hope and the idea is to become a cause entrepreneur via One Hope. Um, so Via One Hope is our platform for empowering other people to go out and serve and celebrate, which is the mission of our brand, yeah. to empower people to serve and celebrate. Do you serve. have a favorite story of someone who's used this in a certain way? Uh, yeah, actually there's so many stories and uh, picking an individual one out is kind of hard. There's, um, 
you know, there's a woman with us who has two children who are autistic, and um, she not only uh, makes an income via One Hope, but she also makes an impact by funding ABA therapy for children with autism. And wow. we here to share That's her awesome. story and um, how One Hope is uh, such a part of her identity on a professional side, but also in the community. Pete, you can't help but get teary eyed. Um, yeah. We have a woman who um, is in the Navy with us, and she does events at her base and she raises money for um, lots of different causes but um, she you know four of our our different products go towards team Rubicon where we reunite veterans with a sense of purpose by sending them out into natural disaster areas mm -hmm. with Rubicon amazing organization and when you have that direct of a connection of this cause entrepreneur who's actually serving in the military and she's empowering this organization by selling um, those products um, it's, it's amazing. And, um, you know, the model is such that, um, because we're not selling through retail or a restaurant, um, we're able to give the cause entrepreneurs, um, commission for marketing the brand out there, but we're also able to give the person who hosts the event an additional 15% of, um, the sales of our most popular items, a six pack, a 12 pack of wine an extra 15% towards their local cause of choice. Mm. So you've got people all over the nation raising money for their breast cancer walk or their kid's school. And they post these stories up about how they raise money that is doing this for the school or is going to allow me to raise this much money for my breast cancer walk. And, yeah. and earlier this year, my grandma passed away from it or my aunt got it. Like all of these are touching. And we're realizing mm. that it's not just us inspiring this community, it's this community inspiring us. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're cause entrepreneurs just like us, and they're, they're using a lot of what we've built and the infrastructure we've built over the years to, um, to launch their business. But it's amazing to hear their stories and their personal journeys, yeah. and it reminds us of ours like nine years ago when we were just getting off the ground. Jake, I want to be the first one to thank you. I know um, this is holiday season right now, and so I promise you I would not make this go too long, even though I'm tempted to make this go another two hours. Um, so where can we point people towards to check out, um, I know, onehopewine.com. Where else should they check out on the web if they want to you know, check out your products or maybe check out Via One Hope? Yeah, so viaonehope.com if, if they're interested in Via One Hope. Mm -hmm. That's where you can – become a cause entrepreneur with us and get a wine education, mm -hmm. be part of a fun community, make an income while making an impact via yeah. One Hope. Um, OneHopeWine.com, we set up a, um, a landing page actually for you guys yeah. specifically and for all the people who follow um, everything that you're doing. So OneHopeWine.com slash inspired shows to a page um, that'll get them uh, a little bit of a special on uh, holiday gifts if they want to yeah. buy them. We have That's great. 50 unique different gifts. Um, and then, um, you know, you'll find us at uh, nationally at Whole Foods. We're launching a big uh, promotion with them at the beginning of the year this year wow. uh, towards ending world poverty and um, funding microloans with them in uh, developing nations for entrepreneurs that are getting started. Yeah. And um, a, a bunch of other places. We're in 8,000 restaurants and hotels and retailers across the nation. But via One Hope and onehopewine.com slash inspired. Uh, will make it easy, and um, I'm definitely going to have to come back and join you. I did note that if you have Bill Belichick on, Bill um, okay. Obama, Bill Knight, um, or uh, it, then then you have to you have to bring me back on. <laughs> and was there another one besides Bill Knight? Um, the one that if I could bring somebody back, it'd be uh, Norman Borlaug. Um, he taught the world to feed itself, and I think that most people don't know his story. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, he's not with us mm. anymore than his the legacy of his work so if i got to go back and i gotcha. and interview anybody norman borlaug would probably be it mm. but i think right now my my list of three is bill belichick michelle obama and phil knight all right so if you could if you could hook that up i mean those <laughs> are pretty easy ask, don't you think? yeah well i'll uh, i'll keep you posted with that <laughs> all <laughs> all big feats in itself but um, Jake, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, especially around this busy time for you. Um, everyone should check out onehopewine.com or via one hope, um, which is via one hope.com. And um, if you want to put backslash inspired in front of onehopewine.com, you will get a discount. Um, so can I throw in one more thing before you close it out? Yeah, you could throw in as many things as you want. Yeah. 
Um, thank you for having me on um, on behalf of myself and our team. Um, every time we get to do something like this and spread the word about our, our mission to serve and celebrate, not only serve um, you know top uh, quality wines, um, gourmet coffee, our gifts, but also serve the community and the country while doing it and gathering people around celebration, whether they're celebrating themselves at the end of a hard day at work or they're celebrating around a wedding or like a, some big milestone in their life. Um, the people who give us a voice and to share us with their community, no matter how big or small, are the reason why you know a fairly grassroots organization that started with $10,000 in the bank in 168 cases in a U-Haul truck loaded into a public storage unit become um, big successes and, and make it to where we are. And they're also the reason why we're going to go from where we are to where we're going. Right. And um, so I, I really do appreciate it. And I think you're a really good interviewer. You let me go and rant uh, uh, back and forth there. And uh, it's fun. It's fun to get to share our vision and our story with you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. And uh, happy holiday. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Talk to you soon, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came